following us. Yeah. So yeah, they're definitely following us. So this could put an end to our video and photograph very quickly. So the security apparatus in Xinjiang was pretty intense. You know, before I went to Xinjiang, I was, uh, in my head, I was saying things like, well, you know, it's probably uh, exaggerated somewhat, but it was actually a little bit more. Those are two of the cars that have been following us for at least a couple of hours now. Colm and James are reporters for Bloomberg News. They've traveled to Xinjiang, China, a region at the very heart of the country's solar ambitions and what government critics say is the centre of a crackdown on Uyghurs and other minorities. Factories like this one churn out vast quantities of polysilicon, the raw material in billions of solar panels all over the world. Solar panels are modules, and nearly all solar panels are made out of polysilicon. Essentially, almost any crystalline silicon module is likely to have a small amount or more of Xinjiang silicon in it. Very few are actually pure. Chinese companies dominate the solar industry and collectively control at least 60% of global capacity at every step in the supply chain. In Xinjiang alone, these four factories, Dacho New Energy, Shinta Energy, East Hope Group and GCL Poly Energy are expected to produce nearly half the global polysilicon supply. In total, China is expected to produce over 80% of the world's polysilicon. The region attracts this industry mainly, I would say, because of electricity. Xinjiang has a lot of relatively cheap coal. Polysilicon is made using a lot of energy. So essentially, cheap electricity means cheap polysilicon. Fueled by cheap polysilicon, solar capacity is set to grow by about a quarter this year. 2020 saw record installations backed by almost $150 billion in investment, bringing solar panels to energy farms and homes around the world. The problem is that this industrial boom is reliant on China's troubled Xinjiang region, and almost no one outside China knows what goes on inside the polysilicon factories. And consumers, companies and governments are growing uneasy about their reliance on the region, rife with alleged human rights abuses. Shinta Energy, East Hope Group and GCL Poly Energy Holdings have been linked to a state-run employment programme that, according to some foreign governments and academics, may at times amount to forced labour. We welcome more foreign nationals to visit Xinjiang and see with their own eyes the achievements made there. We also call on media outlets that are committed to objective and unbiased reporting, as well as professional ethics, to tell the true story through their paper, pen, camera and microphone, which will expose the rumors and the lies about Xinjiang. Mm. We visited uh, four of the polysilicon plants over a period of two to three days. I'm getting the same ringtone, seems to be anyway. Same. So we're just uh, leaving the factory and we have been in touch with them many times uh, to try to set up an interview. Uh, the company has uh, repeatedly said no or are delayed on our requests and most recently said that uh, the topic was very sensitive. So we came here today to see for ourselves and try to see if that would make a difference but the end result was that we were not able to conduct an interview. We're told, on the one hand, come visit, you know, we want journalists to come. But the reality is just so starkly different. The main place that we, we encountered workers was at Shinta. We just happened on the scene just around the time when they were changing shift. And uh, a small group, uh, two or three of those people, stopped to, to listen to, to what I had to say. Uh, at which point they, they went almost on script and said, oh, we cannot speak to uh, reporters, you have to speak to the company, we're not allowed to speak on behalf of the company. They obviously had been uh, well trained by the company uh, to respond to this situation should somebody from the outside, whether it be a journalist or a diplomat, ask them questions about what's, what's going on in the factory. 
we in the end didn't make it into any of the polysilicon factories to see the facilities inside and we didn't get to meet any of the executives and only spotted a few workers. The strictly enforced secrecy in Xinjiang has made the search for answers about links between China's labour programme and its solar industry a problem for outside researchers, who, it turns out, can find telling details just by combing through public records. So this document is from the TBEA website. TBEA is the parent company of Shinter Energy. What it says is something that's so unprecedented, I've never seen this. Uh, the company not only accepts labor transfers of, of Uyghur workers from the government, the company actually has a poverty alleviation cadre. Uh, a cadre is a government official. What do poverty alleviation government officials in Xinjiang do? It says literally uh, in the text, the cadre enters households, talks face to face with the poor, spreads the party's policies, and then it says literally prescribes the right medicine, meaning implements targeted poverty alleviation according to the actual situation of the household. And as a result, the thinking of the villagers has been greatly changed. This is Adrian Zenz, a researcher who recently uncovered unreported documents. Because of his work, Zenz has been a focus of China's wrath. So this, the GCL Energy Company says, as of the end of 2019, the company accepted 121 ethnic minority workers from poor regions in southern Xinjiang. So what you're seeing here is something that's very common. You basically have a, a government farewell ceremony for trained ethnic minority laborers. Uh, you see them uh, lining up and uh, then they go off to their respective companies. You see there's a high focus on uniformity, but the most important always is the text. So you have the transfer of surplus laborers and then you have uh, the whole context, you know, it's, it's a send off ceremony uh, to these companies. One of the companies named here is, is the one that produces polysilicon uh, East Hope. China says their initiatives train workers and send them to factories as part of an effort to help poor ethnic minorities find better employment. The issue here, uh, critics say, is that there's a lack of choice and that when ethnic minorities, including the Uyghurs, are approached and encouraged to participate in such poverty alleviation programs, they're not really left with much room to say no. Attempting to say no to a forced labor program, for example, might land someone right back in a camp or in some other kind of carceral setting. When consumers, um, general public, hear about uh, what's happening to the Uyghurs, the general reaction may have been, oh, that's another human rights problem, or it's China, or it's too remote, or it's another Muslim group maybe causing trouble. But this is not about the Uyghurs anymore. This is about us consumers and free people. The market for solar power has surged as governments and companies around the world race to stop global warming. That means millions of homeowners buying solar panels everywhere face an awful trade-off. Embrace the green future and you're possibly purchasing the products of forced labor. There's little evidence that forced labor is involved in polysilicon manufacture in Xinjiang. That said, any company that's active in Xinjiang is cooperating with the regime there. So it's impossible to have a clear conscience. In March, the US, the European Union and Canada put new sanctions on China over alleged human rights abuses. The US has already banned imports of cotton and tomatoes. The substance needed for solar panels could be next. <laughs>
It's really part of a broader tension between China and the West. It makes me wonder like when or if ever uh, the two sides are going to see common ground on this issue because in my mind it just seems to be we're growing further and further apart.